Good night. It is 39 minutes past 10 p.m. We are on the 6th of July 2023. This is going to be my last recording for today. The right and it's going to be chapter 8. And the title is The First Night. And there's a quote from Dante, The Inferno. Midway on our life's journey, I found myself in dark woods, the right road lost. To tell about those woods is hard, so tangled and rough and savage. That thinking of it now, I feel the old fear stirring. Death is hardly more bitter. I'll just say one or two prayers before I begin reading. I'm only reading the one chapter. It's not that long. I haven't read it, but I looked at the page numbers. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love commits me here, ever this night be at my side, to light, to guard, to rule and guide. Amen. Prayer to Saint Michael the Archangel. Saint Michael the Archangel, defend us in the day of battle. Be our safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him. We humbly pray, and do you, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the other evil spirits who prowl through the world seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. The title of chapter 8 is The First Night. For the remainder of the afternoon, Father Gary could not stop wondering what he might see at San Lorenzo the following day because Father Carmine had given no indication of what to expect. He pictured the worst, images, like Father Daniel's experience of the woman's jaw unhinging and moving over to the side of her face. All he had to go on was an audio clip he had listened to on Father Daniel's MP3 player, a recording of Father Daniel confronting a woman who had inter interrupted Mass by shouting at the congregation, thinking the woman might be possessed. He had taken her and her companion into a side room to try to calm the woman down. At that point he turned on his recorder to Father Gary, the voice on the audio clip sounded nothing like a woman's deep, raspy, guttural. A cornered animal came to mind. Devi dare de no! You have to say no, the voice screamed over and over, followed by periods of wailing and moaning that did not sound human. Devi dear de no, the voice howled again. This time father, followed by Father Daniel's Basta in nomine di Gesir Cristo, ti donodo di sent metere. In the name of Jesus Christ, I order you to stop. Recalling the voice, that voice, 
Father Gary imagined what it must have been like to be in that room, to realise that you were in the presence of pure evil. Father Daniel, Daniel had told him how frightened he had been at the time. Father Gary pictured himself listening to such a hateful diatribe in the room Father Carmine used, which was so small that he had been to be practically on top of the person. If the person went crazy and started attacking, he would be right in the thick of it. That night, after his evening prayers, he spent a few extra minutes asking God for the strength to overcome whatever lay ahead. Well done. That's what you should be doing. On Monday afternoon, Father Gary again stood among the crowds on Via del Tritone, waiting for a bus. He was wearing his black clerics and carried a small bag containing the purple stole he would wear during the ritual, as well as the small red ritual book itself. He had purchased it a couple of weeks before at a bookstore on Via della Consolazione. Even though he was out of practice with his Latin, he planned to follow along anyway. Sitting on the bus as it lurched through the narrow streets, he wondered how this experience would change him. It most certainly would. He arrived at San Lorenzo around five in the evening, just as the sun was starting to set. Traffic was very heavy on Via Tibertina and all the rubber tyres traversing the cobblestones created a high-pitched whine that seemed to stalk him like an angry swarm of insects as he walked down to the basilica. A small group of people stood outside the closed doors to Father Carmine's office. They represented a broad spectrum, an older lady in her 60s, dressed conservatively, a man in his late 30s, two young 30-something women wearing brand new night sneakers and fashionable clothes, and a serious-looking couple in their 50s. Some chatted, while one man stood off on his own his arms crossed tightly across his chest. As Father Gary approached, a few looked in his direction, eyeing him suspiciously. The younger woman with shoulder-length blonde hair refused to even look at him. Taking his place among them, he wondered who they might be. He looked for signs of trauma, anything that might indicate these people were suffering from demonic possession, but found nothing. No, because they look ordinary when, when the demons are not manifesting. <laughs> he knew from Father Daniel that exorcisms, exorcists sometimes did simple blessings. Perhaps the more serious cases had not arrived yet. Remember the old saying, you can't judge a book by its cover. And if they're not in any way praying or anything like that, or in an environment of prayer, if those demonic serpents, evil spirits, what call them what you wish, will be hiding and quiet until such another time. It, it's, it's, it's very different. People don't understand. 
because the person is still the same person it's just that something it's they're not in control of it a few minutes later the door swung inward to reveal father carmine who barely gave the group a glance before shuffling back inside one by one and with an after-you attitude, the group filed inside and took up positions around the waiting room, unwrapping coats and scarves. The door to Father Carmine's office was ajar, so Father Gary gently pushed his way inside and said, Buona sera. Father Carmine returned the greeting and asked, if he was ready. While he watched, hang on. See, Father Gary replied. Good, Father Carmine said. Allora, comunicamo. Okay, let's begin. Father Gary took off his coat, slipped on his purple stole, then entered the small room off the office which contained a wooden end table near the door and four metal chairs, two against one wall and two shoved into the corner. Thinking it would be best to make himself as unobtrusive as possible, Father Gary took a seat in the corner, still only a few feet from the other two chairs. The room, which seemed even smaller from the inside, was an odd setting for an exorcism. Like most European rooms, it had a very high ceiling. Well, that was helpful for anyone who's claustrophobic. <laughs> the upper walls were crisscrossed by exposed pipe, while the lower walls were covered by a fake wood panelling about six feet high. Each wall held some form of sacred image. A framed picture of Padre Pio, oh how nice, along with a hand-woven rug depicting Mary and the baby Jesus on one wall, a purple stole belonging to Father Candido, encased in glass on another wall and a black and white picture of Christ, crowned with thorns directly above the two empty chairs to his immediate right the room's only window which he could reach if he were to stand on his tiptoes was latched shut from his seat he could just make out the contents of a little wooden box Resting on the end of the table near the door, a picture of St. Francis, a rosary, various medallions, a roll of paper towels, a wooden crucifix and a squeezy bottle of holy water. Essentially the tools of Father Carmine's trade. As he waited... Father Gary glanced at the two empty chairs against the wall. Just above their backs, a patch of wood panelling was rubbed and scraped raw, as if someone or something had clawed it. Seconds later, Father Carmine, now wearing a thin wrinkled purple stole, entered the room carrying a plastic shopping bag that he hung on the back of the door handle. Satisfied that everything was ready, he ducked out to the waiting room. Father Gary eyed the bag, wondering why they would need it. Well, for sickness. Or worse. It, a few seconds later, Father Carmine returned with a man in his late thirties who wore a v-neck sweater and collared shirt. 
Father Gary could tell the man was unnerved by his presence. So he tried to put him at ease. Hello, he said, holding out his hand. Michiamo, Don Gary Thomas, Vengo Dalla California. The man smiled as he shook Father Gary's hand. Oh, California, a un passier. It's a pleasure to meet you. The man sat down and Father Carmine stood directly in front of him. Father Gary, perplexed by the man's cordiality, took his seat and opened the ritual book. In nomine patri et fili et spiritu sancti, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Father Carmine said as he blessed the man with a few drops of holy water from the squeezy bottle. Following this, he placed his hand on the man's head and began praying the deprecatory prayer of the ritual from memory, skipping a good chunk of the book that Father Gary had opened on his lap. Deus humani generis condito atque defensor. God, creator and defender of the human race, Father Carmine began. Look down on this your servant, whom you formed in your own image, and now call to be a partaker in your glory. Father Carmine spoke with an even, almost soft tone, the Latin blending in to a shushing sound. Occasionally, as he prayed, he would turn to Father Gary and point to a spot in the ritual. Father Gary tried his best to follow along, although he was distracted by trying to gauge the man's reaction. He should have kept praying, even silently. Initially, the man sat perfectly still, his eyes clenched tight as Father Carmine recited the prayers. After a few minutes, however, he began to cough. At first, just a bit. <coughs> <coughs> then the coughing got worse and worse. He began to move his head from side to side, as if trying to dislodge Father Carmine's hand. Then he began trying to push Father Carmine away, not violently, but as if he were drunk and did not have complete control of his motor skills. Father Carmine, meanwhile, used his free hand to keep the man's flailing arms away. He continued praying the ritual without skipping a beat, occasionally accent accentuating a word from the prayer, as he intoned, Ipse Christus tibi imperat, Christ commands you, the word imperat, commands, was spoken louder, though still not shouted. While he watched, Father Gary prayed, good, a few Hail Marys and our Father silently. Why didn't you do them out loud? The man's cough continued to get worse until he was hacking as if something was stuck in his throat. Well, they can lose their voices. Father Carmine then took his free hand and pushed on the man's sternum, causing him to let out a belching sound. To va Father Gary, it sounded more like air escaping than a belch caused by food. <laughs> the man continued belching for a few minutes, then suddenly stood up and with tightly clenched eyes 
pushed past Father Carmine toward the door. Father Carmine immediately spun him around and expertly plopped him back down into the chair. He continued the ritual for several minutes until he abruptly stopped and tapped the man's forehead with his index finger at the same time roughing up his hair in the manner of an older brother ratting a young, younger sibling. As he did this, the man stopped fidgeting and opened his eyes. He sat for a moment rubbing his eyes, taking a few deep breaths. Come stay, Giovanata. How are you, young man? Father Carmine asked him while patting his shoulders. The man, now fully aware, looked up at him and nodded. Bene, he replied. It took a moment for Father Gary to realise that the exorcism was over. From start to finish, the whole episode had lasted about 20 minutes. Well, he wasn't possessed then. That was definitely that he, he was blessed. That was the small um, expulsion of some evil spirit. As Father Carmine led the man out into his office, Father Gary stayed behind in the room. The exorcism certainly had not gone as he had expected, because it wasn't much of a one, was it? <laughs> he had seen none of the symptoms talked about in his exorcism class, nor the dramatic reactions Father Daniel had described, because they're all different. Everybody's needs are different. Everybody's sickness, everybody's illness is different. So everyone who ha has needs of, of deliverance, prayers or exorcism, their needs are different. Instead, this guy only coughed and belched. Father Gary hated to admit it, but he felt underwhelmed. Well, better that for your first tester. <laughs> he was lucky. He might regret thinking that way later. Next, a conservatively dressed blonde woman in her 50s entered, accompanied by her husband, who wore a tight, slightly crumpled suit. Again, Father Gary introduced himself and sat back down in the corner. Father Carmine asked the woman a few questions in Italian, and Father Gary caught something about not being able to receive the Eucharist. She began to cry, and Father Carmine consoled her. No, 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 ti devevi preoccupare. No, no, you don't have to worry. Father Gary took note that Father Carmine blessed both the woman and her husband, a gesture he found touching. It is not only about the woman, he thought, appreciating the pastoral significance of it and making a mental note to do the same when the time came for him to perform an exorcism. I don't think he's ready yet, do you? <laughs> not by a long shot. As before, Father Carmine invoked the Holy Spirit by putting his hand on the woman's head and then skipped straight through the ritual to the exorcism prayers. This time, the woman went completely rigid and did not move a muscle. Midway through the exorcism, the phone rang in Father Carmine's office and to Father Gary's surprise, Father Carmine interrupted the exorcism to walk out and answer it. As he did so, the woman remained where she was. 
though the rigidity seemed to leave her. She seemed unfazed that Father Carmine had taken a call, while Father Gary wondered whether his mentor was taking the woman's situation seriously. <laughs> After a few minutes, Father Carmine came back in, picking up where he left off. Once he resumed the prayers, the woman immediately went rigid again. The exorcism continued for another 15 minutes. Afterward, Father Carmine blessed a six-pack of bottled water that the couple had brought, waving his hand in the sign of the cross as they walked out, Father Carmine, perhaps sensing Father Gary's confusion, felt compelled to explain. Lea posseduta da un domine muto, he said, struggling to find the right word in English. Cannot speak, so it was dumb. It was a dumb, it was a dumb spirit. He said, a very powerful demon. A mute demon, Father Gary asked, and Father Carmine nodded. Father Gary had heard about mute, mute demons, well, from Jesus himself. <laughs> Through the course, Father Daniel had weighed in on them too. He wondered, though, how an exorcist could tell whether a person was really possessed. by such a demon. Before he had time to question Father Carmine further, the Capuchin was ushering in a couple in their forties. This time, the exorcism lasted about 10 minutes and the only noticeable reaction was the man's continual yawning as with the two previous cases, Father Carmine, Carmine sorry, tapped the man's forehead with his index finger, which Father Gary took to mean that the exorcism was finished. The fourth person was another woman in her late fifties with short curly reddish hair that was noticeably thinning. She entered with her husband and a ten-year-old boy who appeared to be her grandson. Well, I think that's a bit strange, to be honest. I really think that the priest, if it was a serious exorcism, he couldn't keep the child there. That bit I don't understand at all, unless he's only discerning what is wrong. But he can always bind it. A uh, ten-year-old boy who appeared to be her grandson. They all sat and Father Carmine began bantering with the boy. Oh, maybe he's the one with the trouble. <laughs> Asking about school and reminding him to behave. Father Gary could tell that Father Carmine had become almost like a parish priest checking in with people, listening to their problems. After a few minutes, Father Carmine blessed the family, sprinkling them with holy water, and then the boy and the husband left. Alone with the woman, Father Carmine asked her how she was doing. The headaches, she answered in Italian, holding her head. Her voice became choked and she dabbed at tears with a handkerchief. Terrible, terrible, she said. Father Carmine nodded. The woman sat with her head bowed and her arms in her lap as Father Carmine prayed the ritual over her. Tears continued to stream down her che cheeks and she grimaced occasionally a little squeak of pain escaping from her clenched mouth. 
as if she had stomach cramps. After this case, Father Carmine took a ten minute break and he and Father Gary sat down in the office. Early on, Father Gary had decided he would not ask unnecessary questions or disturb Father Carmine's rhythm during the exorcisms. He did not know Father Carmine all that well yet and he wanted to make a favourable impression so he could keep coming back. Now, however, as they paused, he could not resist. How do you know these people are possessed? Father Carmine quickly explained his technique of discernment. He noticed things through little signs. Most of the people, he said, had already been through several hospitals and had seen numerous doctors, none of which helped. This last woman, he said, has terrible headaches, the kind that do not go away. They completely block her. No matter how many aspirin she takes, it does not help, you understand. See, see, Father Gary agreed. But he still was not sure how to be absolutely certain. The course had stressed that an exorcist should be sceptical in the beginning. And while he trusted that Father Carmine knew what he was doing, it bothered Father Gary that the signs were not as apparent to him as they were to Father Carmine. Wary of being disrespectful, he held his tongue. At 6.45, they took a short break and went to the Basilica for evening prayer. Around 15 people, including two other friars, crowded into the Capella di San Tarsicio, just off the sacristy. Among those praying, Father Gary recognised some of the people he had seen in Father Carmine's waiting room. Apparently, he would have to rethink his concept of what it meant to be possessed. Were not demons supposed to stop people from worshipping? No, 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 he's got it wrong. They want to worship. They know they need Jesus. They know they need God. And by God's grace, they are allowed to worship. They want to do that, but it doesn't mean that what needs to be cast out has been cast out. They can do, they can do prayer and worship. They can, they can become very holy and it can take a long while and it can take a short while. But he didn't have that concept in him then, but I bet he did as he went on. They returned to Father Carmine's office and resumed the exorcisms. None of the reactions extended beyond coughing and yawning. Well, he was lucky that time, but if he'd had the big monster first, it might have put him off wanting to be an exorcist. None of the, the one woman coughed so much that she brought up some foam. Well, lucky it wasn't worse. Father Carmine gave her one of the paper towels to wipe her mouth. Then he threw it in the plastic trash bag he had attached to the door. At least Father Gary got an answer to the question about the bag's purpose. <laughs> Toward the end of the evening, Father Gary could see that the strain of so many exorcisms, but they weren't serious ones, but when you're praying with someone like this priest, it is tiring, it is exhausting, it is draining. Um, was Father Gary could see that the strain of so many exorcisms was starting to affect Father Carmine, drenched and aching from being on his feet, because they're on their feet all that time, praying for hours, 
he shifted continuously and hooked his left hand into his rope belt behind his back while he prayed. Father Gary knew he must be exhausted. Finally, at eight o'clock, Father Carmine turned to Father Gary and announced with a heavy voice, We are finished. He could see that Father Carmine was drained. Still, he could not resist. Un momento, he said to Father Carmine. Una domanda, a question. Father Carmine turned to look at him, his eyes lidded and heavy. Come back tomorrow afternoon at 3.30, he said with a nod. We can talk a little then. When Father Gary stepped outside, the streets were practically deserted. A handful of antiquated street lights cast a dull glow over him as he walked briskly to the bus stop on the opposite side of Via Tibertina. Once on the bus, he realised that instead of providing answers, the evening had only raised more doubts. The people had certainly appeared to be troubled, but whether the cause was demonic, he could not say. None had displayed the classic symptoms of demon, demon, demonic possession. He knew that Italy had socialised medicine, that its population was 83% Catholic. Maybe seeing a priest was easier for people than seeing a counsellor. He, he hypothesised. And would not a priest locked in battle against a demon let the answering machine pick up the phone? He had to trust that Father Carmine had the experience to diagnose these people. After all, he had been an exorcist for more than 18 years. Still, something troubled. Something about the experiences troubled Father Gary. He felt let down that he had not found the definitive proof that he sought. So he was a doubting Thomas then, wasn't he? He, he, he? He's not convinced about the need for exorcism. <laughs> oh, oh dear, dear, dear. So chapter nine, I will not do it, but I'll read the front and it's about discernment and the shepherd by Hermas. Every man has close to him two angels, the one an angel of holiness and the other an angel of perversion. And how then, O Lord, shall I recognise the workings of these two, since they both dwell within me? God bless you all and good night. Thank you so much for listening. I'll try to keep up with the reading of this book, for my sake and your sake, because I am finding it very interesting. The reactions of Father Gar Gary, I mean. <laughs> we'll have to see how he grows a bit. <laughs> He'll be in for a few surprises when it gets hot. <laughs> Good night and God bless. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening and sharing.